Hello and welcome to another episode of Tank Wars. Today we've got quite a task on our hands. We're looking at a tank that has a long and varied battle history and another that never got past the prototype stage. It's the AMX ELC Bith versus the M24 Chaffee. Now representing the French, my guest today knows a thing or two about French armour, but I'll let him explain why. Hi Baz, firstly thank you so much for joining us and secondly of course would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Richard, for inviting me along. Um, well, I'm, I'm Bas. I've been collecting Militaria for quite a few years, and I got quite interested in French Militaria at the turn of the century. That's the uh, going into the 21st century, not the 20th. <laughs> um, and uh, I started uh, collecting soft skin vehicles. I then moved into wheeled armour, French wheeled armour, and that was uh, quite an exciting place to be. Um, and then sort of migrated into tracked armour. So... Um, what was a, a hobby is turned into a passion and some may say an obsession. So um, I, I'm certainly trying to, to help you out here with quite a rare vehicle, actually. So uh, excuse me if I make comparisons back to um, uh, French light tanks that I, I, I understand, but that will help me um, sort of position where this vehicle came from. Yeah, as we said before we started, Baz, I mean, obviously, the vehicle you're dealing with, I mean, it's an incredibly hard vehicle to talk about, A, because, of course, you know, it never got past this prototype stage. So, uh, again, and obviously, I have to say that finding somebody to uh, discuss this vehicle was not an easy task. So, thank you, Baz, for stepping up to the plate uh, and giving us a bit more information about that. So, perhaps you want to start us off then with a bit, bit of background? Okay, so very, very quickly... Okay, so what we're looking at is the French in the mid fifties. They wanted a truly air portable um, armored vehicle that would be able to take on Russian assets as they were sweeping uh, through Europe. Uh, so to do that, they had hoped that the development of the AMX thirteen um, would have uh, uh, met that criteria. But unfortunately, the AMX thirteen started getting quite heavy, um, and it was increasing in weight and. AMX is the manufacturer, Atelier d'Isi de Moulinon, uh, and 13 was the weight designation, so it was meant to be 13 tonnes, but it ended up being a lot more than that. So the French did sort of go back to uh, the uh, the drawing board, and they decided to do some um, prototypes, and they sort of farmed the idea out of something called an engine légère de combat, so that's an ELC, an engine that's lightweight and used for combat, engine being sort of vehicle. So this ELC program was started, and there were two competitors. There was AMX, so Atelier d'Isi uh, uh, de Moulinon, and then there was the Brunon Valette company. So you ended up with two uh, ELC um, prototypes. You had something called the ELC Even, okay, because that was just a sort of an acronym for the Brunon Valette company. And then you had the AMX, uh, who were the other manufacturers. They made an ELC as well, but they made two of them. OK, so there was a, 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 an early one using sort of a Hotchkiss chassis. They then moved into um, a copy of the AMX 13 chassis. OK, but a scaled down version that became the BIS. So BIS is Latin for second, but they use it in the French language to it to explain one more or to get better. Um, so that's where AMX, ELC, BIS, quite a, quite a mouthful. And yes, you're quite right, a very rare beastie. <laughs> and I have to say, Baz, I've never heard somebody explain it better than that. So, so incredible. And also the pronunciation. I was never too sure, as I said before. Bis, bis. I was. Uh... <laughs> you've, you've got French people probably watching this and they are holding their heads at this moment. Horrified. Going, Poor English people. What are they doing? They're ruining my beautiful language. But there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, for me, the M24 Chaffee, obviously, I do think I've got the easier task today. Um, my first hands on experience of the M24 Chaffee actually was several years ago at the Muckleborough Collection on the Norfolk coast, um, where I spent several days we were filming and I spent several days getting to grip with this vehicle um, and also had the I was lucky enough to drive it as well, but more about that later on. So the M24 Chaffee, obviously, a varied background and history. Uh, during much of the World War II, of course, the U.S. Army relied on the M3 and the M5 Stuart series of light tanks for their reconnaissance missions. Um, and the M3 and the M5, you know, reliable vehicles, mechanically reliable as well, fairly fast and also pretty manoeuvrable. 
Um, however, of course, we're getting to the stage like a lot of tank design where things were getting dated and out of date. So the Stuart design dated back to what, the 1930s? Um, and it was all but obsolete really by late 1942. So thin armor, high silhouette, uh, and a light main thing, of course, the light 37 millimeter main gun made it a bit of a liability to its crew at this stage. Um, combat experience, North Africa, sort of 42, 43, proved beyond a doubt, really, that the American Army's light tanks, uh, even the improved M5A1, had little value on the battlefield, even in a reconnaissance role. And of course, the main thing throughout when I'm talking about the M24 Chaffees, we have to remember it is a reconnaissance vehicle. That was its designation. That was its task. And I think that's important when we discuss things later on. So by this stage, not only was the M5 outclassed by the German tanks, unable to defend itself against them, it was also very vulnerable to anti-tank guns, uh, in particular artillery. Um, but American doctrine, American army doctrine still believed the light tanks had an incredibly valuable role to play on the battlefield, particularly the reconnaissance role. Um, as long as, of course, like any reconnaissance vehicle, one of the main aims of any reconnaissance vehicle is to avoid direct confrontation with enemy armor. Um, so as a result of all this, the M5 would remain, you know, in tank and cavalry reconnaissance units until the army could replace them with an improved tank. And that's what we saw. In 1943, US Army began developing a new light tank to replace the Stuart, Following several prototypes, we won't go into them all here, we just haven't got time. And of course, the ill-fated M7, we end up with the M24 Chaffee, which entered service in late 1944. Um, M24, nicknamed the Chaffee, as the Americans love to do, giving you know, generals the, uh, the honor of having a tank named after them. Uh, this was a particular one was in honor of Major General Adner R. Chaffee Jr., um, who was actually known as the father of the armoured force. So that's a little bit of a background and intro to the M24 Chaffee. So, Baz, moving back to the French then, um, what about the firepower then? Firepower, okay. Um, just very interestingly on the Chaffee, one second, can I just touch on that as well? Chaffee did yeah, see service with the, with, the French, with the French army. Um, and yeah. I think the, the, that because they were just basically broke after the Second World War, so they had a lot of American uh, support. But they used the Chaffee, uh, they tried to use the Chaffee in Indochina, which you know turned into the Vietnam War. And they were trying to get these Chaffees, the French, into their cut off forts by bringing them in on aircraft. Now, I think your vehicle's oh, 20 odd tons. So you'll call it, you've called it light, you've called it reconnaissance. My God, it was enormous and heavy. And they had to try and fly these things in in pieces drop them onto airfields and assemble them under fire to try and take on uh, uh, the, the communist enemy. So there is a commonality there that what you mm -hmm. had, yeah, or you have, sorry, the Chaffee, and what I'm, what was coming along with the French in the background were actually very, sort of actually intrinsically linked. So the French thought, saw the Chaffee, it wasn't working. The AMX-13 was meant to be air portable. They wanted to try and fly that in an aircraft, but they just simply couldn't. Don't think anyone did until India in the, in the, the early 60s. So they needed a light tank. So they've got this now, this um, uh, ELC beast. They wanted um, to put a pretty stonking gun in it. They've put in a 90 millimeter D914. Now, I don't know the, the complete ballistics of it. Um, I've sat inside of an ELC tank, but I haven't been inside of the beast or driven the beast or even been able to, to, to look at it. So I know we've got a 90 millimeter gun in there. Okay. It's, um, probably the beginning of um, the Panard armoured car development, and they started an, a Panard AML 90. That had a 90 millimetre gun. So what I'm going to try and do is talk about that 90 millimetre because those uh, elements are recorded, and then we transpose that onto what it, it is quite a rare tank. I don't know if you, you or your viewers are familiar with the tank. I don't know if you can uh, find a picture of one, or you're probably playing one uh, in, in, in these games. But if you look at the, the barrel of the tank, it looks very, very similar to um, a, a shortened AMX barrel. You've got exactly the same sort of um, uh, compensator or muzzle on the end of it. And so this 90 millimeters, let's just give you some uh, facts and figures here. Um, so we can, be, we can fire a high explosive through it. We can fire a high explosive anti-tank. What I was amazed at when I looked at it was, although it's quite a slow round as it comes out, it was anticipated to actually um, uh, penetrate over one foot one foot of uh, 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 standard armor at a 90 degree angle. Okay, let's put that in at the end, okay? As soon as you deflect that, that armor to a certain extent, only by about, um, it takes 60 degrees, 
that penetration goes straight down to 120 millimetres. Okay, so it's, what, 12 centimetres. So you've gone from yeah. a foot to 12 centimetres if you're, if you're trying to hit things at, at a slope. And I think you've, you've mentioned this time and time again in, your, in your, 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 your broadcasts. The slope of the armour really does make all the difference. So it was a powerful gun. It had a good punch and probably a very big recoil for the poor chaps who sat next to it. And it has been proven, okay, this is actual fact, that it has knocked out a T-55 and a T-62. So you can, if you place it correctly, you're close enough. I think that's the other thing, okay? And you get that round in early, you can destroy some pretty big uh, uh, tanks. And I'm afraid you're chaffy, but it might, might go down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> The the uh, seventy five millimeter gun on the M six gun was mounted on the Chaffee, um, same ammunition as the Sherman, and of course a lot of the ballistic properties exactly the same as the Sherman because of course you know like everything during this period we're saving money, we're utilising the best of what we can get, and the seventy five millimeter M six gun was a very potent, very adequate gun. Um, However, of course, for the Chaffee, smaller vehicle, they need to have a more compact design. So actually, the gun that was designed for this was originally for use as an attack variant on the B-25H bomber. Um, and anybody who's into, I'm afraid I'm not so much into my aircraft and don't know a huge a lot about it, but everybody I've ever spoke to about this says, you know, the B-25 was a fantastic bomber. Um, the reason it was important, it was a much better fit for the Chaffee um, because it had a shorter recoil. Um, if you, I mean, obviously from my experience of, you know, being in the army and firing main armaments and things, um, the, the recoil of the breach is a fundamental design when they're talking about doing anything really, because of course, the bigger the gun, most of the time, the longer the recoil. The longer the recoil, obviously, the larger the turret has to be and the larger the turret bustle has to be. And for years, you know, tank designs have come up with different ideas to reduce the recoil impact on this. So it was a clever idea. It was something they've already developed for the bomber. Um, so why not utilize it um, actually in the vehicle? Um, various natures of ammunition, uh, high velocity uh, armored penetrating ammunition. Um, the combat records, I'll actually read a bit from a combat record I found about a Chaffee in action at the moment. Now, like, of course, there's always a bit of a caveat when we're talking about combat reports and combat records, um, because, of course, and this still happens to this day in certain operations I've been on, any armed forces will always exaggerate to some degree their reports, okay? Nobody wants to hear about that their division, their battalion uh, went out and, you know, failed miserably against the enemy or something. So we always have to take certain things with a certain degree of a pinch of salt. Um, but most of the time, you know, fairly accurate. It gives you a good indication of the vehicles themselves. Um, now, what do the crews think of this particular uh, firepower on this, the armament on there? Well, uh, there was a report actually I've got in front of me from 744th Tank Battalion, who actually claimed that while better than the M5's 37mm gun, which is not really hard to be perfectly honest, um, the M24 was generally incapable of destroying enemy tanks except at very close ranges. And when we look at other vehicles throughout the period of World War II, time and time and time again, you can see that obviously when they come up against the likes of, you know, Tiger, Panther, um, it is this problem with these vehicles. Um, and also they actually made a big comment there about the amount of ammunition carried by the Chaffee was insufficient. Um, it was something like 48 rounds of ammunition, according to the, the the manual that could be carried on the Chaffee. And again, I use a caveat here because, again, from personal experience in operations, um, whatever they say you can actually carry, you can certainly add another dozen or so rounds on there by the time you've loaded it onto the floor and stuck a few in the driver's compartment and everything as well. Um, but if that's first-hand accounts from there, so straight away you can see, okay, there are you know things which are perhaps not fantastic on there. Um, and they also made the comment that the, because of the ammunition and the amount of ammunition carried, they would expend their full ammunition loads after brief periods of combat, which is obviously not fantastic. Um, Secondary weapons, we had the Browning 30 Cal located next to the main arm. And nothing really to say about the Browning 30 Cal. Brilliant weapon. It, you know, been used for a long time. Very, very effective. We had another 30 Cal bow mounted um, and the, the 50 Cal mounted on top of the turret. Interestingly, again, from crew reports, a lot of people say it's a really weird position where they, they mounted the 50 cal on the chaffee because it's sort of offset and slightly to the rear, meaning you can actually use it 
against infantry or anything on the ground. It was really only used for um, you know, air defence or something, which is a bit of a, a faux pas. And if you look and trawl through a few historical records, you can see that actually the crews themselves had, had moved the mount for the 50 cal further across, more to the front of the vehicle, so they could actually use it as an infantry um, weapon as well. Um, Carrying rounds on there, 440 rounds for the 50 cal, 3,750 rounds for the 30 cal. And there was also probably the final bit of firepower on there, excuse me, it was a two-inch mortar, uh, which was located on the turret roof. That was for smoke and local smoke to protect them, you know. It was a recce vehicle, much like when I was serving on CVRT and that, pop a few smoke, withdraw through the smoke uh, and get away from the enemy. Um, and they had 14 rounds for this. However, this did actually get removed after World War II. Um, so I'll just finish off perhaps the firepower for the Chaffee with a bit of a, a reading here of a report. Uh, on the outskirts of Dormagen, Germany, located along the west banks of the Rhine River, about midway between Dusseldorf and Cologne, a pair of M24s of F Troop 4th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron stumbled upon a pair of German panzers that were identified as Tigers. <laughs> Again, it does actually say in brackets there, some sources have stated they were Panthers. <laughs> Likewise, Tiger, Panther, pretty different vehicles, both awesome vehicles, but pretty different vehicles. The German crews were surprised as the M42 had the advantage of speed and faster turret traverse. Before the Panzers could traverse their turrets towards their smaller, faster opponents, the M24s fired their explosive HE rounds against the thinner side and rear armour of both Panzers, which were enough to set off internal fires, destroying both Panzers. So that's just, uh, it highlights that although there weren't a massive amount of combat reports concerning Chaffee, it was a reconnaissance vehicle. Um, it does highlight the prowess of having a manoeuvrable uh, and a speedy vehicle. And let's, of course, not forget they were not designed for head-to-head -head battles with the heavier German armour. So I think it holds itself pretty well, the Chaffee on there. Um, you mentioned a bit already, Baz, about the armour, but can we, can we talk a little bit more about armour? Um, yeah. Uh, just Can I just go back on a little couple of things you said there on the Chaffee? Um, you have got me hands down on that, if I'm doing a, a comparison. You talked about a crew. Well, well done. You've got a crew. Um, my little um, <laughs> uh, experimental tank had two men. So, okay, very cosy in there. Um, we can come back to that maybe in a minute about how it, how the tank works. That's yeah, what yeah, ergonomics and that sort of thing, thing yeah. There. You talked about rounds. My goodness, you are in a pleasure palace of rounds there. Um, they say they managed to squeeze 36 rounds. Now, I've seen the rounds that go into the, the gun. Um, they're not very long, admittedly, but 36 is still a lot to be crammed in there uh, with these people. And you talked about a, um, a turret traverse. What is a turret traverse? Does that mean it goes more than 10 degrees that way or that way? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the turret traverse on, on, on what I'm looking at, we, maybe we can touch on that again as well. You're talking about armour now. Okay, so we've got 8 millimetres, which isn't very thick at all, all the way through to 15 millimetres. So, um, yes, it's basically sort of the thickness of an aluminium tin can. <laughs> so armour, no. Um, I think, quite rightly, um, we're looking at, on this, these prototypes, speed, manoeuvrability, packing a punch and clearing off. There is no sitting there and trying to absorb rounds. It just it, it just won't happen. The the doctrine in the French army uh, w when this tank was being developed were the, um, that tight light tanks would swarm over the enemy. Okay, so we're not looking their their, their doctrine really started in World War One on the FT the Renault FT tank. So that was to launch lots of two men tanks in swarms, like bees, I think they described it as wasps, to swarm around the enemy, destroy them and, and, and move away. And that's exactly the doctrine that they were trying to do here. Two-man tank, quite a large engine, go quite fast, not really worried about the armour, big gun in it, lots of them, cheap to produce, loads of them, drop them in by helicopter even, okay, swarm around Russian assets, bish, bash, bosh, off they shot again. So making a comparison between your... Uh, fairly good armour uh, and, 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 and the size uh, uh, of, of your vehicle against mine. Well, I'm just never going to compete on that, but wait till we get to manoeuvrability. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah, the chaffee, you, you sort of summed it up there for the chaffee. You know, I would almost say that if I was, you know, being very picky and picking something that was not particularly great about chaffee, of course, you know, you would have to say the armour was not, what we're talking for the chaffee, anywhere between 9 and 25 millimetres. 
Um, now, of course, in, this is inherent for any light tank design, that old, like you sort of touched on there, you know, the negative points about the age of question of trading better armor for decreased mobility. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, the Chaffee, not great armor, <laughs> but it did beat yours, um, which is fantastic. Um, again, going back to what the crew the crew said, um, I mean, they did actually make a big point about the armor uh, protection on there. So what we saw for the M24 was actually no improvement whatsoever over the M5 as far as the army. Um, so uh, a, rec- a report again, again, from the 744th Tank Battalion claimed that the Chaffee provided no appreciable improvements in armor protection and in particular, I thought this is an interesting point, it's belly armour provided little protection against mines, um, which obviously was a thing for the crew. Again, going back to when I was a crew, you know, serving as a crewman, it's funny because, you know, you want you don't appreciate that vehicles, there is a trade-off, obviously, for everything when it comes to armoured design. Um, we're very fortunate, obviously, in this day and age that we've actually got, you know, vehicles that are fairly good across the board. But even with some of those, you know, you had to trade off. I mean, I first started out on Chieftain, um, which, of course, was, I would say, arguably the best main battle tank of that sort of Cold War, Cold War period. <clears throat> However, fair to say that the thing mechanically was an absolute disaster. Um, and it was um, there was always an, a saying that we used to say in the regiment that it was the best tank in the world as long as you broke down in a decent fire position, which always cracked me up. Um, but, yeah, so going back to the M24, um, biggest drawback, it wasn't great armour, but, again, comparing it to yours, it was actually better than yours. But again, going back to it, reconnaissance vehicle, it needs to be light, it needs to be manoeuvrable, therefore the armour is not going to be fantastic. Um, interestingly, we did, when we did some research, funny enough, for the game on the M24 Chaffee, um, we found that the armour, we, we, we'd go through all this process of measuring armour points throughout the vehicle. But again, through the process of construction, you can see that actually the armour is not even all the way around. So you find that certainly on the M24 Chaffee, for some reason, it must have just been in the manufacturing process. If you work your way backwards from the front of a Chaffee, the armour actually tends to get slightly thinner as you work backwards. Um, And the only time we'd ever come across it to this significant degree was, funny enough, when we were looking at the T-34, um, which, again, you sort of understand more for the T-34, by the way, it was, you know, it was an ad hoc vehicle, quickly put together and very cheaply put together, so you can expect to see differences. But, yeah, so, okay, armour. Again, it was one of my sort of semi-negative points, but, again, it beats you, Baz. Okay, you mentioned um, <laughs> you mentioned about some I'm of. I'm going to get uh, you in crew. a minute. I'm going to. I'm yeah, going to get you. you. Uh, the, the crew <laughs> side, the technical side. Let, let's move on to that then. Um, the okay. Edit. Now, on the on the armour front, just very quickly, the French were quite canny and they realised that once one of these light tanks were hit, that was it. That it was game over. So they put a lot of important components in the front of the tank. Okay, this was to give defence to the crewmen because it was easier to produce a tank than it was to train a crew quickly, okay? So I think that may have happened in the Second World War where crews were in short supply, but the tanks were, were plentiful um, in, for some armies, of course. But for the French, they were absolutely critical. Their men were, were absolutely number one. Um, so therefore, the, the vehicle was expendable, but the crew was not. So that was why they only put two people inside this tank. They put the engine and the gearbox at the front. So if it took a frontal hit, the armour probably wouldn't stop the round, but the engine and gearbox would. That gave enough time for the poor crewmen to, to to pop out. So we're looking at crew now, numbers of crew. Yeah, um, crew, um, technical abilities, you know, sighting systems, perhaps something like that. Right. Okay, well, crew. Okay, so I've got two. So you've got family, okay, a nuclear family <laughs> nestled inside of your, your chaffee hiding away somewhere. And I've got two very short men, okay. Um, height restrictions were placed upon the driver and... Um, the commander. Okay, so if you were, they would basically line recruits up, and they would go through them. And the first sort of twenty would go into the cavalry, and anyone after that would have to go into large armor or in something else. So you were chosen for your size. So we had two small men placed inside this tank, and bizarrely, um, but seems to have worked. They didn't want them sat inside the hull. They had them sat inside the turret. So to enter the tank, there's two separate hatches, one for the commander, one for the driver. And they slide in through and your legs go through the basket. Well, there is not really a sort of a basket on the turret into the driving position. So weirdly, the driver was half inside the hull and half inside the turret. This was also saying for the commander. So he had to, to share it between. So as you can imagine, without you being inside of a, 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 a turret basket, if that turret starts to rotate, 
there's only so far I can go before slicing your men in half in, inside the village. Absolutely, what 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 a um, a restriction. So we're only looking at a be able to turn. I don't know, 15, 20 degrees either way. And then if it got to that point, the man would have to stop driving, gather his legs up and his lower torso, and they would both have to try and squeeze into the turret to try and rotate it any further than that. They actually found getting out of the tank was easier to rotate the turret and get back in and fire. I mean, in a, in a battle zone, well, good luck on that. So I think they were really, really hopeful that it was the manoeuvrability of the chassis Okay, it was lightweight chassis. They could move the chassis, and then the gun would naturally fall uh, in the direction, and then they would make incremental changes on the actual uh, turret rotation. I believe there was a hydraulic system in there, very similar to the AMX thirty. Now I've used that hydraulic system; very accurate, very noisy, but very accurate. Gets up, gets on on target quickly, and Bosch off goes the round. It was manually loaded. Okay, so I've talked about the AMX thirty and had an auto loader. You know about that. You've done a, a, a great program on that. You can find it on YouTube. But um, this one manually loaded, so someone had to reach back, find one of these 36 rounds hidden somewhere in the depths of the tank, stuff it into, sit back, go, OK, gun goes off, moves at least at least a foot backwards inside the turret, right next to your head, completely deafening you, and then you have to start the process again. With only the two men, they would have been just run off their feet. How can you control the tank, drive the tank, fire the tank, listen to orders, and then read the ground, and attack an enemy. And there's only two of you. Yeah, that, we could have done with that family, but then the tank would have been something much different. <laughs> you mentioned the AMX 13. Yeah, a few years ago, I actually, you know, it was the first time again I'd sort of come across an AMX 13. And uh, I have to say, I mean, I'm five foot 10. And uh, I, I would say I struggled um, actually getting in, you know, the commander's side and everything. It wasn't easy at all. I was, I was quite, it's really small, really narrow, isn't it? And I think, you know, I think back to when I was serving in the British Army, um, if you're wearing webbing, if you've got body armour on and all the rest of it, it must have been an absolute nightmare. And interesting, I think it's a point that doesn't really get discussed much. We've, um, you know, the British Army, we've always talked about crews. And, you know, historically, we've had crews of four for, you know, donkey's years now. But, of course, it's not just fighting the vehicle. It's what happens when, and let's face it, you know, any operations I went on, it would be about, you know, an hour a week of actual, like, chaos and doing something as far as the enemy was concerned. The rest of the time you're sitting around, you're going into a hide location. You know, how do you put up a cam net, for example, with a two-man crew? It must be an absolute nightmare. How do you do things like, you know, uh, stag on at night so you've got a guard duty and sentry and all this sort of thing as well? So, yeah, I can only imagine having a two-man crew is really hard. Anyway, going back to the chaffee, you're right. I mean, you know, I beat your hands down on the chaffee. I mean, you couldn't get any more in there. Funnily enough, the number of people in the chaffee is a bit of a, a bone of content and a bit of discussion all over the place because, you know, uh, you read lots of stuff and it says the chaffee was operated by a crew of four. Or was it? Um, you know, you've got other reference material that also says you've got a crew of five as well. I've actually got the operator's manual here for the M24 chaffee. And what it states in there is, word for word, it does state you can have a crew of five if you have a loader. So we end up with a commander, a gunner, a loader, a driver, an assistant driver, stroke bow gunner. Um, and that's it. So, but the original design for the M24, when you read anything, says it was a four man crew. Um, and the assistant driver was there to serve as the loader. So the idea was when the main gun was in use, he would pop back up into the turret and, as, and act as the loader. Um, so it's not even easy to answer, I think, of the chaffee is how many of the crew were in there. Certainly, most things you read about the crew of four was most of the time in operations. Um, you know, perhaps not a bad thing to have a spare space. You know, in a battlefield environment, you're going to get stragglers, you're going to get other crew vehicles that are knocked out you're going to have room there for somebody so i think you know as far as the crew is concerned let's leave it as it's possible to have a permanent five-man crew where manpower allowed i think that's probably the safest bet on there you, you crew talk, reports as well about... sorry go on i was just going to pick up on that because you said when you were in the um in the in the british army so obviously you had the sort of downtime and stag stag I, I i understand that i don't think we would have had that with the elc helicoptered in dropped behind front lines in twos and threes just to crack on with it. I don't think there was going to be much downtime for them at all. But, but you're still going to have that to... Direction and running in that direction. But you're still going to have the times where, obviously, if they're in operations and they're going to have to, you know, they're asleep. They've got to have sleep at some stage. You know, what do you do when you've got a two-man crew and one of you, well, I would imagine, you know, 
all right, if they work as whatever the equivalent was in the French army, but we work as troops, obviously, in the British army. So it used to be three tanks and a troop. Now it's four tanks and a troop. Uh, but you've always got people rotating around sentry duty and all that sort of thing. But, you know, any armoured vehicle at some stage has to stop, you know, even little things like, you know, cooking and replenishing the vehicle and everything. Right. It's uh, With a two-man crew, it's I got spoke, a pretty, pretty full-on. <laughs> I, spoke, I spoke to um, a French tank driver who drove the AMX series of tanks um, back in the day. And I said to him, I said, look, there must have been he goes we learned to actually use the bathroom whilst they were driving so there are drain halls that are positioned in the hole that if you got it just right you could actually get things out of the hole quickly and enable you to continue driving so i think the french doctrine was a bit harsher well that sounds that <laughs> sounds drive, pretty drive, hard drive. Yeah. i want to pee well don't stop driving you can just pee where you no, sit that no. sounds pretty that's hardcore <laughs> it is it is uh, other things, the crew the crew really liked the um, improved telescopic sights on the M24. Um, it does actually say that there's a lot of crew reports that say they've got ample room in the turret. Now, okay, I mean, I, I served briefly on CVRT, sort of Scorpion. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard for me because I'm a main battle tank man. So, in my mind, ample room is, you know, the turret of a Challenger 2 or a Challenger 1 or something like that. Um, but, of course, when they they were comparing it to the M5, it was a big improvement on there. You know, I've been inside the turret a few times now, the M24, and there's not a huge amount of room. And, again, it's one of these points that it is, it is really critical, um, especially during operational periods, that you've got some comfort within a main battle tank. People find this funny, but, of course, if you spend an awful lot of time inside that environment, if it's uncomfy, if it's a poor ride, if it's you, you get tired, you get fatigued really quickly. And if you get tired and if you start to suffer from fatigue, then that impacts on everything, you know, and fundamentally impacts on your ability to fight adequately. Um, you know, from a commander's perspective, if I was, we, we did this weird exercise once in the British Army about uh, not sleeping to see how long you, the brain and body could function. Um, without going for sleep. And I think we lasted, it wasn't even long, it was like 48 hours or something until there is a dramatic decrease in my, my ability to map read, even my communication over the radio to the other tanks to, you know, back group command and that sort of thing becomes really bad. And, and of course, you know, any armoured vehicle, any tank, the interior is a death trap. If you're tired, you're going to put your foot in the wrong place, you're going to get it caught in traverse, there's going to be injuries that occur. Um, so, you know, it's important the comfort to a degree uh, for the crew. Um, also, we had uh, a stabiliser on the Chaffee. Um, unfortunately, it was a stabiliser for the gun that only worked in the vertical, not in the horizontal. So, but in theory, it would still allow the tank to fire its main gun on the move. However, from everything I've read, the actual crews say, um, but in practice, because of the turret seating was not stable enough to make use of all the sights when they were on the move. Um, so effectively all of the shots would actually be blind. So, again, it's another one of these great things in the manual says, you've now got a stabiliser, you can fire the gun and move. Putting it into practice for the poor old crews, they found that, yeah, that's that's not a particularly easy thing to do. And, again, from experience myself, it's even on today's main battle tanks, which is obviously all computer-assisted. We've got, you know, stabilised guns to, through the yin-yang. Still firing on the move is a really difficult and tricky thing to do. It's a 100 times easier than it would have been for these guys in this day, um, but it's still not, you know, you're not guaranteed a hit, should we put it that way. Um, okay, uh, but, 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 moving on then, Baz. Uh, what about sort of mobility, engine-wise, for you? Okay, this is this is where I start coming into my to my own. Yeah, I'm just I, go I thought you were going to say two, that. Two, two seconds on the crew. You mentioned about the crew. It depends what you put inside the crew to how well that they can perform in the tank. French rations at the time for this, the crew <laughs> that would have driven this, okay, included cigarettes. So they were inside the rations. Alcohol. So there would have been um, half a jerry can, it's like 10 litres of red wine per person, okay, and, and, and baguettes. So I, I can assure you I've tried that that combination, and it's rocket fuel. So that's so. who cares about comfort if I'm completely hammered on red wine and smoking <laughs> my galois um, while that's chewing fantastic. on a baguette? So French people are going to think I was being um, disrespectful. So I'm not uh, – I, I, I think that their rations were – were, were, were great and i wish um uh, we'd had them as well so okay um mobility yeah so we're we're moving pretty fast in this so what sort of speeds are we going to get up to okay 41 miles an hour on a flat even surface i've driven i've got a, a number of amx tanks amx 13s i've driven 
okay, at 35 in that tank, and I had to get outside to have a nervous breakdown. The, the, it is fast at that sort of speed. Once they were going off-road, they were still going to maintain over 30 miles an hour on rough terrain, okay? I think for our, our European colleagues, that's 41 miles, uh, uh, 65 kilometres an hour on the flat, and you'll have to tell me what the 30 miles an hour is. Is that 50 kilometres an hour? It's so you got 50-ish, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so what, what was powering this? What was moving this tank forward? So um, if you look at some of the sources, they'll say that it had the AMX-13 engine in there, the SOFAM, uh, 8 GXB. Okay, that is not the case. Okay, so we've got a little mistake we've noticed uh, there. They only could fit half the engine in. Now, I'm very familiar with what the uh, 8 GXB looks like, and it's probably as big as the tank itself. So they put half of it, half the bank in. So in effect, it should be a SOFAM 4 GXB. Okay, so that's in there. That's a fast petrol engine. We've got um, two tillers uh, in front of you. Um, and pulling on those is, is acting on a differential rather than braking, okay? So you're able to, 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 to turn its speed. If you put brakes on, you know, Richard, you would have seen this, on a small tank, put the brakes on right-hand one when you're going too fast. There's a tendency you could could roll the tank maybe or certainly put it in an un uncompromising position. This, it was on the diff. So the diff was just reducing the power, not braking the tank. So uh, maneuverability was, was, was absolutely fantastic. Just very quickly, I'm going to touch on, I think this is where I want to try and come back to you on your chaffy, your, your, your American superior chaffy. Okay, the height. All right, so I think you're coming in at 2 metres 11. Um, you, you'll correct me on it. I'm coming in at 1 metre 58. 158. That, that's done nothing. That's like um, an SUV today. So we've got a small tank. It's the usual, it has to be 2 metres wide, 5 metres in length, because you've got to have the right... Um, relationship between the width and the length of the tank to turn it effectively so you the the, the length dictates the width etc so you got 2.2 meters in width five meters length which is the same length as the amx 13 believe it or not the, the chassis and we've only got 1.5 i'm coming back to that 1.58 what a low silhouette i mean the driver must have been laying down to drive this um and with that speed that engine that maneuverability we can maneuver in behind assets russian assets or Indeed, your chaffy and Bosch, we've got a big round uh, uh, to wake you up. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I can't beat you for that. I mean, uh, <laughs> as far as the M24, yeah, I think you mentioned earlier, weighed in a little over 19 tonnes. OK, so, you know, it, it is, you know, it's not heavy, heavy compared to some vehicles, but it's certainly not a particularly light vehicle. Um, I'm always a big fan of, I'm terrible with the metres, but you're quite right. So length, 16 feet, so about 18 feet in length with the main gun, um, transposing to meters. That is, I'm terrible with my calculations between that. Uh, and a width of nine feet, four inches. And you're quite right, the height was about, you know, just over eight feet. So again, I'm afraid you beat us hands down as far as the, the silhouette's concerned. And like I say, it's important, you know, for the nature of the vehicle, it's, you know, you want any sort of reconnaissance type vehicle because of the task it does to be as small as possible, to nip in mm. and around the burns, to, you know, have a low silhouette. Um, and I'm afraid, yeah, you, you beat us on that. Um, the drive itself, um, I actually loved the drive of the Chaffee. I have to say, when I first came across it, as I said a few years ago at Muckleborough, I was, um, uh, because I knew fairly little about it, I knew the history of the vehicle and this sort of thing, but I'd never had any practical experience with the Chaffee. Um, and so when I was lucky enough to actually get amongst it and to have a play with it and to take it for a drive and everything, I have to say, what a great little vehicle to drive. Um, and like any vehicle, once you got a hand, a grip of the controls, it was really simple. But one thing that, funny enough, always struck me with the Chaffee compared to an awful lot of other vehicles was how quiet it was. Um, you know, it really is a quiet vehicle, um, which I was really surprised with. Um, the engine itself, uh, the same dual Cadillac series, you know, 42 V8 um, gasoline engine as the M5, but it had an improved transmission. Uh, put on there, which made a great deal of difference to it. Eight speeds forward, four in reverse. I have to say, when I was driving it, I could only actually get in one reverse gear, so I was obviously doing something wrong there. Um, speed, 35 miles an hour, you know, give or take. Um, so I'm afraid you also you also beat us on that as well. Um, uh <laughs> Important critical thing for the Chaffee that the M5 didn't have, new torsion bar suspension, which replaced the older vertical volute system that you found on the M5. Um, 
important to a crew as well, not only for, obviously for operational purposes, but it made a much better ride. Um, and critically, it was a much better stable gun platform. Um, again, going back to when I was serving the British Army, we would see that when we came you know, to modern tanks with hydrogas suspension, it was a absolute world apart. Um, but for, you know, what we, uh, I started on Chieftain, we had spring packs, which were just horrific um, for every reason. If they went, you know, if you had to change them, it would probably kill one of you when you're trying to change it. It was just an absolute nightmare. And to hydrogas suspension, it was unbelievable. And it meant that really the faster you go in a main battle tank today, the smoother the ride is. So it's unbelievable. Um, and of course, they put on wider tracks as well. The reason they put on wider tracks was lessons learned from the M5, reduce that ground pressure uh, and improve the cross-country capability. Um, so again, going back to the crew reports, because I always think this is really important to talk about, they praise the Chaffee's speed, they praise its manoeuvrability, they praise its mobility in mud and snow. They do actually praise its low silhouette, but obviously at that time they weren't comparing it to, uh, to French vehicles. Um, and I think critically what they also do is praise its mechanical reliability. And I can't emphasize enough that, you know, reliability for any tank crewman is absolutely so, so, so fundamentally important. You have to feel that your vehicle is not going to let you down at the worst possible time. Um, and that's what the Chaffee gave to the crew. Um, so there we go. Uh, fantastic. Okay, so Baz, having heard all of that, how would you sum up and, and sell me your vehicle? Okay, they're cheap. They're really cheap. <laughs> they're, using, they're using known technology stolen from the AMX-13. They just dang miniaturized everything. You don't have to put a, um, a large crew into it, but they do have to still be skilled because they've got a lot to do. I think it's highly maneuverable. It goes quite fast, and I think what they want at the beginning, and this is the difficulty of comparing what I'm talking about and yours, is yeah, this course, was yeah. to be air mobile under a helicopter, okay? Brought in, dropped, asset, off it goes, bish, bash, bosh. It was cheap. There's only two people in it. Let's drop a, another dozen of those. So it's, it's difficult to make the comparison. So in some ways, it's lightweight. It was cheap. It's fast. It's got a big punch, but you couldn't survive uh, much attention from artillery, for example, and that'd be the end of you. Um, you're right, Baz. I mean, it's incredibly hard to, I mean, A, to compare, I think, any vehicles of this, you know, this type, but even when we're talking about a vehicle, I mean, obviously the Chaffee has got this, you know, what do we have in the end? We had 4,730-something tanks uh, Chaffee's produced, manufactured by the end of production in August 45. Um it was the US's last light tank to see extensive combat action. You mentioned earlier on um, about it, where you know where it served. It served with a multitude of countries and a multiple of operations. I mean, you know, we saw it was with the Brits. It was, as you said earlier, with the French. It was with the Australians. It was with the Canadians. Um, it was a very, very liked and loved vehicle at some particular stage. Significant improvement over the previous vehicle they had, the M5. It still possessed all the drawbacks we've sort of discussed throughout this of any light tank, exactly the same as yours, you know, namely thin armour, relatively weak firepower. Um, but again, like all of these, I'd argue that when it was employed in its intended role, so reconnaissance, it was an extremely effective vehicle and capably served the US Army in two wars, as well as armies of, you know, as we said before, numerous allies, uh, including us Brits, of course, um, for years to come as well. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, we've done our best, but obviously the final decision is down to the players. What they prefer. I know what you prefer playing in game anyway, Baz. So anyway, so. Uh... <laughs> I will just uh, add, I will just, quite the final, just very from me, then I'll, 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 I'll close down. My tank is beautiful. <laughs> All French tank. This, I have to say, from a just. Fine. From a just <laughs> looking at it, um, I have to say it, it, it is an attractive it's tank. It's, it does, it's amazing. It does. It's futuristic. And it's, yeah, it's. It's got je ne sais quoi, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Baz, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, right. A fascinating insight um, that you've given us into vehicle, which, you know, let's let's be honest about it. <laughs> People don't know an awful lot about it. Um, so really, thank you so much for your expertise and indeed okay. your time. Um, any final comments from you? Anything you'd like to give a shout out to? I'm assuming your, uh, your, your Facebook oh, group, yes. perhaps? <laughs> for those people using Facebook, which I, I understand is now for an older generation, this is something that was uh, <laughs> uh, uh, announced to me the other day. Um, we have a, a Facebook site, so it's called French 
Army Reenactment Group. Come on, it's an open uh, 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 forum. You see all the pictures of all the tanks and the armoured cars that we've been working on. You'll see period uniforms, blogs, chat, everything. So look us up and, and come along. Brilliant. Baz, once again, thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend. Um, to all of you that are watching, thank you so much for taking the time out to spend with us. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and until next time, take care.